During World War II, Canada was tasked with protecting Britain's supply lines in the Atlantic. Without them, Europe would fall in a matter of months. Hitler knew that hitting Canada right at home would sever the incoming resources from America, rendering Britain helpless for Operation Sea Lion, the complete invasion of England. Subsequently, the Third Reich deployed over 15 U-boats to cripple the Canadian Navy and disrupt the flow of supplies from North America to England. The U-boats torpedoed anything within reach, severely damaging or sinking dozens of Canadian vessels, including a civilian ferry that was caught in the fire. The nation had not had its waters penetrated by a foreign enemy since 1812, and the frantic operation to repel Germany's attacks and prevent further destruction of Canada's assets would become known as the legendary Battle of St. Lawrence. By that time, Canadians finally realized their government's desperate efforts to keep the supply to Europe open, even at the cost of hundreds of lives, and how close the fight had actually come to them. A Navy Out of Nothing In 1939, when war erupted in Europe, Canada found itself lacking in maritime power. The Royal Canadian Navy, or RCN, struggled for the past decade amidst the dire financial situation that faced the nation. Just a few months before Germany's invasion of Poland, the King's Cabinet had cancelled the production of four anti-submarine vessels and two motor torpedo boats destined for the RCN. By September, Canada found itself at war against some of the mightiest world powers while owning a mere 13 ships to defend both of its far-reaching coastlines. To make the odds even greater, America seemed to have no intention of joining the war, and Canada was given the crucial task of protecting the supply lines that nourished England through the Atlantic Ocean, just as they had done before during World War I. If the supply lines were successfully cut off, Britain would not obtain the minimum weapons and raw materials necessary to make a stand against Hitler. Crippling Britain in such a way would surely mean the prompt fall of Europe before the expanding Third Reich. Canada's all-important purpose was set. To achieve it, the nation began an aggressive and unprecedented industrial production plan. The program would have to turn its 13-ship navy into a fleet flaunting hundreds of vessels in less than two years to provide the nautical convoys necessary to reach its goals. The clock was ticking, and the pressure was on, especially after the fall of France in 1940, which cleared Germany's pass into the Atlantic Ocean. With the path unhindered, Hitler deployed all the might of the Kriegsmarine into the North Sea. The sooner he could strangle Britain's lifeline, the sooner Europe would fall. In response, Canada deployed all the ships it could, which would come out of the shipyard and into the battlefield. Thanks to its diligent efforts, Canada's initially insufficient number of vessels was a thing of the past. However, a fleet of unmanned ships did not make a world-class navy. At the start of World War II, Canada only counted 129 officers and 1,456 men amid its ranks. Then, as France fell, Canada rushed a two-week training program to hurriedly bolster its Navy's numbers. It would come as no surprise, then, that the results were less than ideal. As the old sailing proverb goes, quote, while it takes two years to build a ship, it takes five years to train a sailor. Many soon-to-be mariners had never seen the sea, as they were farmers, factory workers, and businessmen. Nathan M. Greenfield even relates in his book, The Battle of St. Lawrence, The Second World War in Canada, that, quote, the crew was so green that they were seasick within hours of leaving the jetty in Quebec City. And seasickness was not the only obstacle that awaited these brave servicemen. The conditions aboard Canada's hurriedly produced anti-submarine corvettes were less than optimal. Ventilation shafts would allow seawater to pass into the crew's mess hall, which meant that the new sea soldiers had to live and work constantly drenched while evading the floating leftovers of food and personal belongings. In contrast, the men serving the Kriegsmarine's U-boat task force had years of experience and an impeccable discipline, plus all the advantages that state-of-the-art submarines bring. As the Germans took control of the Atlantic, the RCN prepared for an uphill battle. U-boats at their doorstep. Canada heroically embraced its mission from 1940 until the end of the war. The RCN protected the ships carrying supplies to England to the best of their abilities, and Britain was able to prevail through the Blitz. 
However, the fact that the RCN was still a medium-sized and inexperienced force meant they did it while paying a hefty price, leaving their shores unprotected. Carl Dernitz, commander of the Kriegsmarine, took advantage of this weakness and brought the war directly into Canada's waters in an attempt to crush the RCN's deployment right from its roots. On May 12, 1942, the U-553 approached the Gulf of the St. Lawrence River, seeking calmer waters to conduct repairs. The commander immediately realized how unprotected the river's mouth really was. Seizing the opportunity, the U-boat fired several torpedoes at the British freighter Nicoya, which stood just a couple of miles off Anticosti Island. The submarine then pursued and fired upon the Dutch freighter Leto, obliterating it in a fiery explosion and continuing the onslaught. After sinking both ships, the U-boat returned to the Atlantic. It was a fruitful night for the Nazis, as they had brought the war to less than 400 miles from Quebec City. This action sent Canada's government into a frenzy. They wondered how the Nazis could destroy two Allied ships inside their territory, and how they could be so close to Quebec without raising any alarms. Canada suddenly realized how vulnerable they were to a Nazi invasion from the Atlantic. With their navy busy escorting shipments to Great Britain, they had left only four ships to defend the mouth of the St. Lawrence. This was a massive vulnerability, and now the Nazis knew about it. The Allied strategists then met for an emergency summit. However, as terrifying as the events had been, they concluded that the St. Lawrence was a secondary target for Germany. Rerouting their already thinly spread resources to that location would hurt their overall war efforts, so Canada only received a few corvettes to reinforce the river. The St. Lawrence remained vulnerable, and the Nazis continued to press on. On July 20th, the U-132 sank three freighters near the Gaspé coast and severely damaged a fourth one. The U-boat managed to escape, even after being pursued by the corvette HMCS Drummondville. Later research would show that U-boats had a considerable advantage when attacking in that area, as the merging of fresh and salt water in the river's gulf created a thermal anomaly that would mess with the Allied sonars, making it much harder to pinpoint the precise location of the submarines. More attacks followed. In September, the U-1517 infiltrated the St. Lawrence Bay, sank nine ships, and damaged another while evading the RCN's effort to stop it. A month later, the ferry SS Caribou was torpedoed by the U-69 in Cabot Strait, just a few miles from St. Lawrence's Gulf. Despite a valiant rescue operation, 131 passengers perished. And as before, the U-boat escaped unscathed, much to the frustration of the pursuing minesweeper HMCS Grand Mare. The German U-boats continued to humiliate the RCN efforts during the following months, sinking several other ships and even landing quite a few spies in mainland Canada. Still, most of the agents were promptly captured, but a few managed to infiltrate Quebec and other large cities, extracting valuable information on Canada's convoy routes and strategies. A difficult decision. On a large scale, the U-boat attacks were of minor significance to the overall war efforts. Thanks to Canada's escort operations, Britain was able to prevail, and Germany was losing time, resources, and men. Besides, with the entrance of the U.S. into the war, the scenario was looking much bleaker for the Third Reich. Nevertheless, from a local viewpoint, the Battle of St. Lawrence was a political disaster. Canada's government tried to keep the attacks from the press. Instead of helping, this action fueled the rage of the civilians who knew what was happening, and many of the coastal towns where the people could see the sinking ships with their own eyes panicked. Distrust for Canada's leaders continued to grow. As their inability to protect the St. Lawrence became more evident, they decided to completely close the bay to transatlantic traffic on September 9, 1942. Shipments to England were then rerouted through the ports of Halifax and New York. At the time, many considered the closing of the bay as the worst decision ever implemented by the government of William Lyon Mackenzie King, showing an admission of defeat before the might of the Kriegsmarine. However, in hindsight, many historians consider it a brilliant tactical choice by Canada one that halted the U-boat attacks in the area while supporting the global Allied war effort. In the end, a slow and steady strategy won the race. After the closing of the St. Lawrence and the continuing growth of Canada's navy, the Nazi U-boats were forcibly recalled into the Atlantic to reinforce their comrades as their numbers were quickly dwindling. 
and during the tragic Nazi attacks in the Gulf of the St. Lawrence for more than two years had been tough, but it had also bought precious time for England, the US, and other allies to prepare for the eventual liberation of Europe. By 1944, Canada had one of the most potent and experienced naval forces in the world, and the Nazis were no match for them. Thank you for watching our video. Let us know what you think of Canada's role in World War II in the comments below. And don't miss any of the fascinating historical stories from all our channels by subscribing and hitting the bell icon.